The Iliad, Book 21 When they came to the ford of Xanthus, the eddying river that Zeus begot, Achilles split the Trojans. Half he chased toward the city, across the plain where yesterday the Greeks had fled from Hector's shining rage. Hera, to slow this stampede of Trojans, spread a curtain of fog before them. The others swerved and found themselves herded into the river. They crashed down into the deep, silver water as it tumbled and roared through its banks. You could hear their screams as they floundered and were whirled around in the eddies. Fire will sometimes cause a swarm of locusts to rise in the air and fly to a river. The fire keeps coming, burning them instantly, and the insects shrink down into the water. Just so, Achilles. And Xanthus's noisy channel was clogged with chariots, horses, and men. Achilles wasted no time, leaving his spear propped against a tamarisk, and holding only his sword. He leaped from the bank, like a spirit from hell, bent on slaughter. He struck over and over, in a widening spiral. Hideous groans rose from the wounded, and the river water turned crimson with blood. Fish fleeing a dolphin's huge maw hide by the hundreds in the harbor's crannies, but the dolphin devours whatever it catches. Likewise, the Trojans beneath the river banks. When Achilles' hands were sore from killing, he called twelve boys live from the river to pay for the blood of dead Patroclus. They were dazed as fawns when he led them out, their hands bound behind them with the leather belts they had been wearing around their corded tunics. Achilles' men led them back to the ships, and Achilles returned to his killing frenzy. On the way back, he met a son of Priam, Lycaon by name, running from the river. This boy Achilles had captured once before in his father's orchard, where he had come one night to cut fig saplings for chariot rails, but found Achilles' iron mask in his face. That time Achilles sold him, for a good price, to Jason's son on Lemnos, where he had shipped him. A family friend, Aetion of Imbros, had ransomed him for even more money and sent him to Arisbe. From there he managed to make his way home. For eleven days he celebrated with friends, his escape from Lemnos. On the twelfth day, Zeus gave him back to Achilles, who would send him now off again against his will, this time to Hades. He was all but naked when Achilles noticed him, having discarded helmet, spear, and shield, because they made him sweat as he clambered up from the river, and his knees were giving out. Achilles was indignant and said to himself, What's this I see? The Trojan princes I've killed are going to start rising from the moldering gloom? Judging from how this one has escaped his fate, after being shipped off to Lemnos and sold, all that gray sea couldn't keep him back. Let's give him a taste of my spearhead, and see whether he comes back from that, or stays put in the teeming earth. And he waited. Lycaon approached in a daze, intent on grasping his knees. All he wanted was to wriggle away from death and black fate. All Achilles wanted was to run him through. His spear flashed out, but Lycaon, stooping to touch his knees, ducked under it. The spear passed over his back and stuck in the earth, quivering with desire for a man's flesh. Lycaon caught Achilles' knees with one hand and held the pointed spear with the other and would not let go of either as he begged. I am at your knees, Achilles. Pity me. 
You have to respect me as your suppliant, for I tasted Demeter's holy grain with you on that day you took me captive in the orchard and sent me far from my father and friends, sold into sacred Lemnos for a hundred oxen. I ransomed myself for three times that. This morning was my twelfth since getting back to Ilion, after many hard turns, and now fate has put me in your hands again. Oh, Father Zeus must hate me to give me to you twice. My mother bore me for a shortened life. Leothoe, old Altes' daughter, Altis, lord of the Liliges, whose stronghold is steep Pedastus on the satin Oasis. Priam had his daughter as one of his wives, and we're her two sons, and you'll butcher us both. Godlike Polydorus, you've already killed. Got him with your spear as he led the charge, and now this is it for me. I doubt I can escape, since it was some god who put me in your hands. But I'll say this too, and you can think it over. Don't kill me, since I'm not from the same womb as Hector, who killed your gentle, valiant friend. Priam's glorious son spoke words of entreaty, but heard a voice without a trace of softness say, Shut up, fool, and stop talking ransom. Before Patroclus met his destiny, it was more to my taste to spare Trojan lives, capture them, and sell them overseas. And now they all die, every last Trojan. God puts into my hands before Ilion's walls. All of them, and especially Priam's children. You die too, friend. Don't take it hard. Patroclus died, and he was far better than you. Take a look at me. Do you see how huge I am? How beautiful? I have a noble father. My mother was a goddess. But I too am in death's shadow. There will come a time, some dawn or evening or noon in this war, when someone will take my life from me with a spear thrust or an arrow from a string. He spoke. Lycaon's knees and heart went slack. He let go of the spear and sat there, both hands outstretched. Achilles drew his own sword and struck near the collarbone. The whole blade sank into his trunk, and he fell prone to the ground, black blood trickling out and wetting the dirt. Achilles slung him into the river by his foot and cowed over him as the current bore him off. Lie there with the fish. They will lick the blood from your wound, your cold funeral rites. Your mother will not lay you on a bier and lament. No, eddying Scamander will roll you out to sea, and fish will dart up under the black ripples and nibble at Lycaon's shining fat. All of you Trojans will die like that. Die all the way back to Troy's sacred town, as I whittle you down from behind. Your river won't help you with his silver eddies, the water you've sanctified no doubt with bulls, and with live horses thrown into his pools. No, you'll all die, die ugly deaths, until you have paid for the Greeks' loss, for Patroclus dead, killed by the ships while I was away. As he spoke, the river roiled in wrath and pondered how to foil Achilles' efforts and save the Trojans from this pestilence. Meanwhile, Achilles attacked Asteropaeus, son of that Pelagon who was born of a river, the wide Axius, who lay with Periboe, eldest of the daughters of Asasamus, as Achilles charged him. Asteropaeus, carrying two swords, stepped from the river to face him, his courage coming from Xanthus, who was angry because of all the young men cut down in his stream by Achilles. When they were within range of each other, the shining sprinter addressed Asteropaeus. Who are you with the nerve to face me? And where are you from? It's your parents' loss. Pelagon's glorious son answered him, 
Why ask about my lineage, son of Peleus? I came from Paeonian soil, a distant land, and I led its spearmen here to Ilion eleven days ago. My lineage is from wide-flowing Axius, whose river water flows loveliest on the face of the earth. Pelagon was his son, and my father, men say. Now, let's do battle, glorious Achilles! It was a threat, and as Achilles raised high his spear of pillion ash, Asteropaeus, who was ambidextrous, hurled both his spears. One hit Achilles' shield but did not penetrate, stopped by the layer of god-given gold. The other spear grazed his raised right forearm, drawing a welt of black blood and sailing on until it punched into earth unsatisfied. Then it was Achilles' turn, and he rifled his shaft at Asteropaeus with murderous aim, but missed the man, the ashen spear boring into the bank up to half its length. Drawing his sharp sword from beside his thigh, the son of Peleus made a furious leap, and in the space of that leap, Asteropaeus tried once, twice, three times to pull Achilles' spear from the bank, but only got it to its quiver. The fourth time, he tried desperately to break the shaft, but Achilles got to him first with a quick slash across his belly. His guts oozed out, and he went down gasping in darkness. Achilles jumped on his chest, and as he ripped off his armor, his boasts rang out. Lie there like that, sons of Zeus Almighty, are too tough for even a river's offspring. You say you are born from a wide-flowing river, but I boast that I am descended from Zeus. My father rules the Myrmidons, Peleus, son of Aeacus, and Aeacus came from Zeus. And just as Zeus is stronger than any river, Zeus's sons are stronger than any river's sons. There's a great river beside you right now, if he can help. But no one fights Zeus, not even the great Achilles, not even Ocean, who from whose deeps every river and sea, every spring and well flows. Even he fears the lightning of Zeus and his crackling thunder. He pulled his bronze spear from the bank and left Asteropaeus lying in the sand, quite dead. The dark water lapped at his body, and the eels and fish went to work on him, nibbling at the fat around his kidneys. Achilles' next move was to go after the Paeonian charioteers along the river. They were in shock at what they had just seen, their best man and leader utterly destroyed by one strong swipe of Achilles' sword. He killed them easily. Thersilochus, Maidon, Astipelus, Menesus, Thracius, Aeneas, Ophelestes, and with his blinding speed he would have killed more had not the river, assuming human semblance, called to Achilles in a voice that came deep from his eddies. Achilles, you are stronger and do more harm than any man, for the very gods assist you. If Zeus has allowed you to kill all the Trojans, at least drive them from me, and do it on the plain. My beautiful streams are clogged with dead men. I can no longer pour my waters into the sea, choked with corpses, while you blindly go on killing. Let it be. I am stunned, O oh warlord. And Achilles, the great sprinter. As you wish, sky-bred Scamander. But I will not stop killing these insolent Trojans until I have penned them all inside their city and taken on Hector. It's him or me now. And he leapt on the Trojans like a god. Then the swirling river spoke to Apollo. Silverbow, child of Zeus, 
You have not kept his stern commandment to stand by the Trojans, and aid them until the evening comes on, and shadows darken the planet's deep soil. He spoke, and Achilles took a flying leap off the bank and came down in midstream. The river rushed upon him in full spate, and with all the force of its current swept along the bodies of Achilles' many victims and washed them ashore, roaring like a bull. At the same time, he sheltered the living in deep pools where his water flowed smooth. Around Achilles, the wall of water arched high and pushed against his shield. He lost his footing and grasped at an elm, a tall, stately tree. But it fell, uprooted, and tearing away the bank, crashed with its thick branches into the water, bridging the river's width. Achilles jumped out, and, afraid now, began to sprint across the plain, but the great god wouldn't stop, chasing him with a black crest, determined to stop the sprint shining sprinter and save Troy from ruin. Achilles got about a spear cast ahead, swooping like a black eagle, the great raptor that is strongest and swiftest of all winged things. The bronze plate clanging on his chest as he leaned into his stride to escape the river that followed him with a tremendous roar. A farmer has dug an irrigation ditch to lead the water from a dark spring into his garden plots. Now, hoe in hand, he is knocking out the dams from the channel, and the water sweeps all the pebbles along the bottom as it sluices down, and the man leading the water is left behind. So the river kept overtaking Achilles, fast as he was. Gods are stronger than men. Whenever Achilles tried to make a stand and put up a fight, and see if perhaps all the gods in heaven weren't pursuing him, the sky-swollen river would pound on his shoulders, and Achilles would jump. His morale was sinking. The strong current was wearing his knees out and cutting the ground from under his feet. With a look in the sky, the son of Peleus cried out in distress, Father Zeus, not a single god is stepping in to save me from the river. Pitiful as I am, if I escape this, I don't mind dying later. I blame my mother more than any deity, with her lullabies that I would meet my death under Ilion's walls, shot by Apollo. Better to be killed by Hector, Troy's best, one good man killed by another. As it is, I am doomed to a wretched death. Caught in this river like a swineherd boy, swept away while crossing a winter torrent. Then Poseidon and Athena were with him in human form, clasping his hands and pledging support. Poseidon saying, Fear not, son of Peleus, nor be afraid. Two gods are with you, with Zeus's consent, Pallas Athena and I. It is not your doom to be vanquished by a river. He will soon relent, as you will see yourself. We have good counsel for you to accept. Do not cease from war until you have driven all the Trojans who escape from your hands within Ilion's walls. When you have killed Hector, return to the ships. We grant you this glory. And they were off to the company of spirits. While Achilles, aroused by the gods' command, turned toward the plain. It was all flooded now, awash with splendid gear and the floating corpses of slain young men. Achilles sprinted hard, straight into the current, and the wide river could not hold him back. Athena's strength was in him, but Scamander was still in spate and raged even more strongly against Peleus' son. Lifting his waters into an arching wave, he surged to a crest and called Simois. 
Join with me, brother, to hold in check this human strength, or he will soon storm Lord Priam's great city. The Trojans can't stop him. Help me beat him back now. Fill your currents with water from your springs. Rouse your torrents. Raise a great wave and make it churn and rumble with logs and stones so we can stop this wild man who thinks he can fight on par with the gods. His strength will not help him, nor his beauty, nor his splendid armor, which will lie deep in slime. And I will shroud his body in tons and tons of pebbly sand, nor shall the Achaeans know where to find his bones. So deep the silt I will bury him in. This will be his monument. No need to heap a mound for his funeral. And he arched high over Achilles, boiling and seething with foam, blood, and corpses, the livid surge of the sky-swollen river, cresting and poised to overwhelm Peleus's son. Hera shrieked, terrified that the great river would sweep Achilles away in its current. She called to her son Hephaestus and said, Let's go, Clubfoot. We thought that you were matched up with Xanthus. Hurry up and show your fire here, and I'll rouse up onshore winds from the west and south to drive your flames over the Trojan dead and burn them in their gear to a crisp. You burn the trees around Xanthus's banks and surround him with fire. Don't back off, no matter how he whines or threatens. Keep the pressure on until you hear me shout. So Hephaestus kindled his fire, and it swept across the plain, burning the dead. The many corpses left by Achilles, and evaporating the glittering water. Late in the summer... The north wind drives out a freshly watered orchard, and the man who tills the orchard is glad. The plain was parched, and the dead consumed. Then the fire moved toward the river. The elms, the willows, and the tamarisks burned. The lotus, the rushes, and the galingale that grew lush on the beautiful river banks burned. The eels and the fish in the eddying pools, tortured by the heat Hephaestus concocted, plunged and darted through the glassy currents. The river itself burned and pleaded with the god. Hephaestus, no god can oppose you, and I will not fight you in your blaze of fire. Stop, as for the Trojans... Let bright Achilles drive them from Ilion. I will not help or hinder. And as he spoke, his water seethed, as if in a cauldron set on a fire, stoked with kindling, boiling to melt, rich hog fat, and bubbling over. The river burned, and his water boiled, impossible for it to flow any further in the tormenting blast of Hephaestus's heat. Then his words rose up on wings to Hera. Hera, why has your son singled me out for punishment? I am not so guilty in your eyes as Troy's other allies. But I will stop if you order me to. Make him stop too, and I will swear not to ward off Ilion's doom on that day when Troy goes up in flames, burned by the warlike youth of Greece. Ivory-armed Hera heard his plea and spoke to her darling son, Hephaestus. Hephaestus, my glory, hold back. It is not right to attack an immortal for the sake of a mortal. So Hephaestus quenched his fire, and the river Xanthus flowed again, but its fury was quelled. 
Hera, though angry herself, had calmed these two. The other gods, though, were at each other's throats, clashing like contrary winds. At the force of their collision, the earth clanged like a cymbal, and the sky blared like a trumpet. Zeus, sitting on Olympus, took it all in, and laughed with delight at the spectacle of the gods closing with each other in combat. Ares began with an assault on Athena, landing in front of her with a bronze spear. What are you doing now, dog fly? Setting the gods against each other? Whatever way your high spirits dictate? Remember when you goaded on Diomedes to wound me, with everyone watching? You guided the spear into my noble flesh. Y'all pay the price now for what you did then. And he stabbed at her tasseled aegis, which not even Zeus's lightning can pierce. Athena backpedaled from his bloody snout and scooped up a jagged piece of black granite that lay on the plain, a huge boundary stone from days gone by. It flew from her sculpted hand and caught Ares on the neck. His knees buckled, and he went down, covering a good acre or two, hair grimed with dust, armor clattering around him. Athena broke into a laugh and crowed. You simpleton, you still haven't learned that I'm too strong for you, or you wouldn't try to match up with me. Maybe this is what your mother wanted when she cursed you for abandoning the Greeks and giving aid and comfort to the Trojans. And while she turned her luminous eyes away, Aphrodite came up and led him off by the hand, groaning heavily. He was barely conscious. Ivory-armed Hera took notice of this, and her words took wing to Pallas Athena. Mystic daughter of Zeus, that bloated tick is leading Ares out of battle. Get on her! Athena was only too glad to comply, charging Aphrodite and punching her in the breast with her clenched fist. Aphrodite collapsed in a heap, taking Ares down with her. The two of them lay on the teeming sod, and Athena's boast flew up to the sky. May everyone who fights for Troy against the Greeks wind up like this, and may they all be as brave as Aphrodite was when she helped Ares and confronted me. We would have ended this war a long time ago and destroyed Ilion's foundation stone. This brought a smile to Hera's lips. Then Lord Poseidon spoke to Apollo. Phoebus, why are we two holding back? It's not fitting. All the others have started. More shame on us if we return to Olympus and cross Zeus's bronze threshold without fighting. You start. Since you're younger, it would not be proper for me, since I am older and no more. Has your mind gone soft? Don't you remembering the suffering that we too, alone of all the gods, endured at Ilion that time we came here from Zeus's side and served proud Laomedon for a year at fixed wages? He was our boss, and I built for the Trojans their city wall, wide and beautiful, to make Ilion invulnerable. And you, Phoebus, herded their cattle in the winded foothills of rigid Mount Ida. But when the year was up and the time came for us to be paid, Laomedon outrageously robbed us of our wages, threatening to bind us by hand and foot and sell us off to distant islands and to lop off our ears. So back we went, angry and disgruntled, over the wages he promised but did not pay. It is his people you are favoring now, when you should instead be working with us for the utter destruction of these insolent Trojans, together with their children and blushing wives. And Apollo, lord of the distances, 
Earthshaker, you would call me imprudent if I fought with you for the sake of mortals. Pitiful creatures who, like leaves on a tree, flame briefly to life, eat the fruits of the fields, then wither and die. No, we should desist immediately and let them fight on their own. And Apollo withdrew, too well-bred to slug it out with his paternal uncle. But his Hellcat sister, Artemis, queen of wild things, reviled him mercilessly. Running away, Apollo? What a collapse! Poseidon can claim an easy victory now. That bow you carry is as worthless as wind. Don't let me catch you bragging again, as you always used to in our father's house, that you would take on Poseidon in open combat. Apollo turned away without a word, but Zeus's august wife was furious with her. Do you think you can cross me like this, you bitch? I'm not an easy opponent for the likes of you. Even if you do carry a bow, Zeus's little lioness, with license to kill whatever woman you please, you do better to hunt wild game, deer in the woods, than tangle with your betters. But if you want a taste of war, you might as well find out how undermatched you are against me. She seized her wrists with her left hand and ripped the bow from her shoulders with her right and with a smile on her face used these weapons to beat her about the ears as she twisted and squirmed, spilling the arrows out of her quiver. She finally got away and fled from Hera, weeping as a dove flies from a falcon into a cleft in the rock, leaving her bow and arrows on the ground. At this, Hermes turned to Leto and said, Tell you what, Leto, I won't fight with you. Zeus's wives are pretty tough customers. You have my permission to boast openly that you have beaten the daylights out of me. Then Hermes, thus, and Leto gathered up her daughter's curved bow and arrows from the swirling dust, and then withdrew. Artemis crossed Zeus's bronze threshold and sat down sobbing on her father's lap, her fragrant robe fluttering. He held her tight, and laughing pleasantly, asked her, which god has done this to you, child? Outrageous! It's not as if you would misbehave. And the huntress, ribbons in her hair. Your wife Hera beat me up, father. She's always causing trouble among the gods. And while they talked in heaven, Phoebus Apollo entered sacred Ilion, afraid that the Greeks would breach its walls and exceed their destiny that very day. The other immortals went to Olympus, some of them angry and some jubilant, and they sat down around their father, the dark cloud. Meanwhile, Achilles was still killing Trojans, both men and horses. When a city burns, the smoke rises to the wide heavens, and the god's wrath fans the fire and drives it on. Everyone suffers, many grievously. Such was the suffering Achilles caused the Trojans. All the Priam stood on Troy's sacred wall. He saw Achilles as a prodigious force, before whom the Trojans were being driven helplessly. Groaning, he climbed down to the ground and called to the gatekeepers along the wall. Hold the gates and wide open until the army can run inside the city. Achilles is here driving them on, and I fear the worst. When they are all inside and can rest, close that double doors tight. I dread the thought of that monster leaping inside the wall. He spoke, they thrust back the bars, and light poured from the gates. Apollo leaped out to keep Achilles from Troy. 
The Trojans were streaming toward the city's high walls, parched with thirst and white with dust from the plain, with Achilles at their backs with his spear, maniacal in his rage and lust for glory. The Greeks would have taken Troy right then, had not Apollo lifted Antenor's son, Agenor, to one bright, peerless moment to put into his heart the fortitude to defend himself from death's heavy hands, then stood nearby, leaning on the oak tree, and enfolded in mist. So when Agenor caught sight of Achilles, sacker of cities, he halted. His heart brooded darkly, and with a sense of great oppression, he said, Now I'm in for it. If I run from Achilles the way the others are, like panicked animals, he'll catch me anyway, and butcher me like a lamb. But what, what if I let these others go? Let them be driven by Achilles, and run myself away from the wall, toward the Ilian plain, until I reach the foothills of Ida, and hide out in the thickets. Toward evening, I could bathe in the river, cool off, and maybe make it back to Troy. Why am I talking like this? To myself. It's all over if he spots me turning off, away from the city and toward the plain. He'll chase me down with his great speed, and then there will be no way to escape from death, since he is far stronger than any man alive. Then why not face him in front of the city? His skin is not impervious to bronze. And he only has one life in him. Everyone says he is human. It's just that Zeus, son of Cronus, gives him glory. And he crouched to await Achilles' onset, heart pumping, ready for battle. A leopard steps out from the deep bush, in full sight of a hunter, completely unafraid. Even if she hears the hounds baying, she will not turn tail and run. And even if the human is lucky enough to strike first and hit her with his spear, she will not give up, but will fight on with the spear in her body until she is killed or gets her claws in him. So too Agenor, Lord Antenor's son, would not give up until he had tested Achilles, he poised his balanced shield before him, took aim at Achilles, and shouted, I'll bet you hope to capture Troy today, don't you, Achilles the Splendid? You fool! There's still a lot of sorrow to be endured for her sake, and within her, our many brave men standing before our parents, our wives, and our sons, and protecting Ilion. No. It is you who will meet your doom today. I don't care how great a warrior you are. And the javelin flew from his heavy hand, hitting Achilles' shin just beneath the knee. The newly forged tin greave clanged loudly, and the bronze spear point ricocheted off the armor that the god had given him. It was Achilles' turn to charge Agenor, but Apollo denied him victory, snatching Agenor off in a curtain of mist and escorting him softly out of battle. Then, with a ruse, Apollo got the son of Peleus away from the Trojan army, likening himself to Agenor in every detail. He stood just before Achilles, who gave chase, pursuing him across the plain, then turning him along the banks of the swirling Scamander. All the while, Apollo, beguiling him, stayed just out of reach, and Achilles, with his foot speed, thought he would catch him. This bought time for the panicked Trojans to swarm gratefully into the city, they no longer had the will to wait for each other outside the city walls to see who had made it and who had died in battle. Everyone whose legs could carry him stampeded in.